Best Book Bits podcast brings you Stephanie Stacks, a food counselor, nutrition educator, and chef instructor. Stephanie Stacks, culinary nutritionist who works hands-on with individuals and groups to transition to a healthier way of eating. She's been studying food and healing for more than 30 years and is the author of the book, What the Fork Are You Eating? Stephanie, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. No worries. Now, for audience who don't know who you are, we're going to go back into your past just a little bit. Take us mm-hmm. back to your early illnesses in the 80s. Oh, God. Um, early illnesses in my 80s. I mean, now that I'm um, nearing 53 and I've done as much healing and research as I've done, and I'm a mother of two kids, uh, I'm just, you know, I am a trauma survivor and my body kept the score. And I was very sick as a kid. I had terrible asthma bronchitis, recurring pneumonia, recurring um, allergies, and everything sort of manifested into a much larger autoimmune disease and kidney disease, which I live with today, which I'm super grateful for because what it is that I've chosen to do for a living has really helped me. Um, I was just brought from doctor to doctor and I was just drugged over and over again in the 80s. And, um, you know, I'm somewhat inquisitive and curious and doctors couldn't answer questions. They were all saying the same thing. And so as a teenager, I started cooking in a health food store for my summer job and I started to do a lot of my own research asking a lot of questions, changing the way I ate. And with that, I started to feel better. And so it led me down this incredible, um, and I say it in a positive way, rabbit hole, um, to uncover some of the most unbelievable people doing incredible work from Dr. Sherry Rogers, who wrote a book called Tired or Toxic in the 1980s, early 1980s, maybe even the late 70s. And um, Andrew Weil, who was really practicing um, botanical medicine way back then. Um, Also, Dr. Anne-Marie Colbin, whose culinary school I ultimately ended up going to, uh, the Natural Gourmet Institute for Health and Culinary Arts. And I just studied whatever was out there, whatever I could get my hands on. And I experimented. I loved to cook. I had an adoring grandmother who um, love to cook. And as as I do joke, um, I think the healthiest thing in my entire childhood was what I was fed. So I did have good food around me and I did have people who love to cook. So I picked that up and I used it to my advantage. I'm, I'm sort of relentless. I'm um, extremely stubborn and I wasn't willing to except, sorry, I can't help you, or no, this won't work, um, or that's a silly little idea at all. I wasn't willing to accept it. If you said no, that meant go for me. Where were you born and raised? I was born um, outside of New York City. And for the most part, that's, you know, that's where I was raised. Yeah. In the suburbs. Yeah, got it. Uh, the New Yorker really comes out of you. No equals go. So uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I am. I, I'm in. I'm a New Yorker uh, through and through. Even though I can't stand New York City, I am a New Yorker through and through. No, for, I'm from Melbourne, Australia. So anyone from America or in that vicinity, yeah, you're. you're that's fine. So yeah, in the '80s, physical illnesses. That's where it sort of all started. So it was very visceral for you. So it wasn't something you were studying mentally. It's something that was happening to you physically. And you needed a physical solution to the problem. Is that sort of a good sum up of it? It is. And, you know, when when oftentimes I'll talk to people who want to do what I do, um, younger kids, and, and I've done that over the years, and they're like, Stephanie, we want to do exactly what you do. How do we do it? And I said, well, you know, outside of schooling, what are the sum of your experiences? Because sometimes, you know, that's what puts you in this place of passion and purpose. And um, you can't teach that. You know, I, I came to this because I needed to survive. And this was how I survived, literally how I survived. So you went to the, you went to the culinary school after that. And then what happened there? 1999, you launched your private practice working one-on-one to help prevent 
illness and restore health through the personalized nutrition therapy and culinary guidance. Can you expand on that a little well, bit? Well, you have that down. Um, well, it wasn't as straightforward <laughs> as that. Um, I had graduated from college and gotten more into uh, PR and marketing and advertising and um, design. And I did that for several years. I was actually, um, I went into college as a bio major but because my life was crumbling, I just needed something that wasn't so heady. And I ended up minoring in writing and majoring in photography. So um, I ended up in the arts. And so out of college, I was more into the arts and, um, and communication. And I hated it. And I wanted to love what I do and do what I love. And so this had always been a passion, um, almost an obsession when it comes to Food products in the marketplace, I'm a bit of a rain man, so I know when companies have changed ingredients or when packaging changes, it's just, it's something I know. And um, I can just see, I see it on the labels. It's not like it just comes to me in a dream, but I see it on the labels. And because um, my, my mind retains that information somehow. And, uh, and I just, I decided that you know, life was too short. And I had an adoring grandmother who wanted me to do what I love. And so she offered to send me to culinary school. And I got to study with Dr. Anne Marie Colbin, who was my mentor in the 1980s. And um, it was an extraordinary experience. It formalized my education. And I really thought that after culinary school, I was just going to open up a joint and just cook and feed people. I had, um, while I was in school, I had worked for a catering company in the city and I started doing some private cooking, particularly with people for il with illness. And um, it was after culinary school and one of my teachers, I was back at school doing, we had these Friday night dinners and I was back at school and the teacher came up to me and she said, listen, I need you to do me a favor. I'm about to give a lecture. I need to give a lecture tonight to a bunch of women with cancer up at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital in New York City. She said, my babysitter just called to cancel. I need you to do the lecture for me. And I said, there's no way I'm doing this lecture. I don't know how to, you can't put me in this position. And I was arguing with her and she just looked at me and she's like, yeah, you don't have a choice. You're doing it. And it was like, I couldn't refuse. And I went up there and I'm standing in this large classroom in a hospital in front of 40 women who were either living through cancer treatment, post-op, just diagnosed, and it was daunting. And I was tasked with talking about how diet could help shape their health journey. And I just remember having this bizarre out of body experience and, 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 and looking down on myself saying, how could you do this credibly? You're a chef. You don't have any real degrees in nutrition or medicine or, and I was like, huh, this is what I want to do. I want to change lives. I don't just want to cook for people. I was 31. And I had literally a near breakdown after that because I realized I needed to go back to school. And so put myself into a program with uh, prerequisites and I applied to several places, only wanted to go to teacher's college at Columbia University and I was fortunate enough to get in. And that's where I got my master's in nutrition education. And then from there, I received additional certifications that you had to, you know, study for, do hours for, um, sit for exams for. So um, that's my journey. And then Thank I you. really parlayed into a private practice from there. Thank you for sharing that story. Yeah, I wanted to fill in the gaps. Uh, I didn't know what the gaps were. And yeah, it's an amazing story. And sometimes the biggest breakdowns is the greatest breakthroughs. And without you going there and being faced with your your own immortality of lack of knowledge, you went, you know what? I don't know what I'm talking about. And I don't. I, you, it, you did know what you're talking about, 
but you wanted to actually professionally go, you know what, I want to, I want to be able to serve these people at a higher level. So you yeah. took the initiative, you went back to school and, and here we are now. So let's fast forward, talk to me about when the book came about, why the book came about, what the fork are you eating? And then we'll jump into some funny anecdotes about how yeah. the name came about as well. So, um, I had contributed to several books and you get to a point when you're asked to contribute to multiple books and people want the knowledge that you have, that you're like, why am I contributing? Maybe I have enough information to write a book. And I had a really interesting aha moment because you sit with this idea of, well, who am I? I'm not a celebrity. I don't have a lot of money. You know, no one's going to want to publish me. You know, um, I'm a nobody. And, um, I sat with it for a little while and I had this incredible aha moment where I have an older son who's an ice hockey player and he was uh, seven at the time and I had him at an ice rink, not that far, well actually quite far from my house because the closest ice rink is an hour and a half. But So I had him at an ice rink, he was doing a clinic and I was sitting in the stands and there was a woman not that far from me. And with, with her, she had um, a younger son who was screaming, crying. He must have been about a year and a half. She's so busy watching her son on the ice, she wasn't really paying attention to him. So I'm watching this whole thing go down. She reaches into her diaper bag. She pulls out an empty baby bottle. And then she pulls out a bottle of red Gatorade. And she pours it into the baby bottle. Red Gatorade. So red Gatorade has red dye number 40 in it on top of tons of sugar. Red dye number 40 is scientifically proven to create or promote hyperactivity in already hyperactive children. So you have a hysterically crying child and she gave this kid red Gatorade. He shut up. I, I, I could not like physically handle how infuriated I was. And there was nothing I could do. So I said, you know what? Am I going to sit here with all this information or am I going to try to write that book? And then that was sort of the impetus to try to find an agent and go about it so I could get published by a house versus being published, um, self-published. And so, um, I was blessed enough to get published by Penguin Random House, uh, Tarcher Imprint. And um, people always ask me, how long did it take you to write that book? And I joke, 30 years. But the reality is, is I actually wrote that book. It's embarrassing um, because it, it lets people know how obsessive compulsive I am. I wrote that book in about um, eight weeks. It's a 400 page book. I took my, my book success in 50 steps uh, 10 years to write uh, 500 books to get it done but yeah right. no, your book did take your book did take 30 years and then eight weeks to put all that knowledge together yeah. so i totally understand what you mean and yeah thank you for sharing that story about the red gatorade quite a quite a funny story i i thought you ran over there and said what the fuck are you what the fuck are you doing? yeah that's so the, therein the, lies the title right yeah so there's a, a book that. series called the there's a book series called the fuck series obviously mark manson made a made it famous i believe the name someone wanted you to name the book what the fuck are you eating but if you want to expand on the story about how you're like no no no, this is uh this is my life this is my practice i'm not going to be known as that that person right. with the fuck series in the book and you, you can know, swear on this podcast by the way oh good <laughs> because i swear all the time yep. so um i was just telling someone this story the other day actually um you know, I was at the point that I, I had an agent and I was working on the book and I was struggling a bit with, with the title um, because you, of course, want it to be catchy. And I was actually sitting at the table that I'm sitting at now with a friend of mine. And this was, you know, back in 2012, 2013. So I don't know if you know the series Go the Fuck to Sleep. Okay, so there's this... At that time, this PDF was going around to parents with young kids, and it was written by this father. I don't even know his name, but it was called Go the Fuck to Sleep. If you, if you Google it, you will actually 
find it um, with Samuel L. Jackson narrating it. I mean, it's unbelievable when he narrates it now. And it's now a book. So my friend said to me, you know, go the fuck to sleep. I'm like, yeah. She's like, I mean, we all love that. I said, yeah. She goes, well, you know, um, it literally is turning into a book and it's been pre-sold on Amazon and it's like gone. She looks at me, she goes, you need something like that. And I'm like, so Julie, what do I call the book? What the fuck are you eating? Because that's what I think all the time. And she goes, holy shit, that's what you call it. And so I kind of started with that. And then I was sitting around a table with uh, my agent and uh, uh, one of my mentors who is considerably older than me. And um, she said, honey, I know you have a mouth like a truck driver, but you are successful in your practice because you have so much compassion and so much patience and tolerance and space for people who need guidance. That doesn't come through if you say, what the fuck are you eating? So I was like, okay, so why don't I call it, what the fork are you eating? And then bam. Yeah, thank you for the story. It's a fascinating <laughs> it's a fascinating story, but I think fork is the right analogy because we are sort of eating our way to the grave with our forks, uh, knives and spoons as well. But we're going to get into the book. So What the Fork Are You Eating? It's about uh, an action plan for your pantry and plate. Some of the notes I got from the books, which I want you to expand on, which is you say, understand the ingredients, tell you the story of your food. So understanding the ingredients tells you the story of the food. The longer the list on the back of the food, uh, the more processed. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah. So I think the important thing to take from that is, um, you know, when you go into a supermarket, um, you don't really turn around a package to look at the list of ingredients. We oftentimes just register heart healthy, whole grain, um, 100% natural, or just natural. And there's this great video called The Natural Effect that is just hysterical, which completely mocks these kinds of labelings. So, you know, in, in the book, I have a whole um, area that that deconstructs labels. Um, it's called Food Labels 101. And then I go into health claims also and nutrition facts. But in the end, these banners on the boxes do not tell the story of your food. The ingredient labels do. And as I always say, if you can't pronounce something that's listed in your food, don't buy it, okay? When you read an ingredient label, the first item listed, so let's just say we're talking about bread. The first item listed should be flour. And then a whole host of other things, not the second ingredient being sugar, not the third ingredient being maltodextrin, which is another form of sugar. So it's important to understand what our food should be comprised of versus what they're actually comprised of. So if you turn around and you read an ingredient label, you'll understand. If you're getting a seed cracker, it should have, you know, some kind of flour and seeds and nuts and oil and herbs and a little salt. And that's about it. Maybe egg. Well, the, the, pr the problem is we're relying on government food agencies that we know we're going to jump into that in a sec. So I, I will talk about that. But one last question that I got, can you tell me if this is true or not? Sugar can be listed 50 different ways on a list. A hundred percent, if not more at this point, right? So <clears throat> you've got, I mean, and I list them all in the book, but you've got everything from sugar to cane sugar to Florida crystals to date sugar to coconut sugar. You've got words that don't even have sugar in it, like dextro dextrose, maltodextrin. Um, you've got, uh, well, you've got the invert sugar, corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Golden syrup um, and beet sugar. It's another one. Beets are 99% genetically modified, which is a whole other thing. But, you know, um, not all sugars are created equal. Some are far more processed than others. And you really should not see it listed on your ingredient label 
more than once, maybe twice. Let's let's go back in the history. How did this all start? And what, what it's 2022 now. Like, how did this practice start with this, you know, massive food industry around the world and just going to the supermarket and being fed shit? Like, yeah. why? Why did it start and how did it start? And what's the agenda behind it? Well, I think, I mean, I think there are multiple agendas behind it. Um, and we could talk about that for days, right? Um, some of which I do try to um, dissect a bit in the book for people's understanding is in terms of the, the basic history of, um, you know, the United States Department of Agriculture and the FDA and how food regulations came about. Um, but I think the, the gist of it is that as, as agriculture became industrialized and we were moving more towards a convenience-based nation or society, you know, we want things fast, big, fast, big, fast, big, fast, you know, industry responded and that was better, right? Bigger, faster, better, bigger, faster, equaled better. And so that's how industry responded. That's how government responded. And unfortunately, it's our health that suffered. It's our food producers that have suffered. And we're seeing the deleterious effects of it now. I mean, the, I think it's, you know, $47 billion, trillion dollars, sorry, $47 billion is the cost of multiple chronic conditions that our global society lives with. You know, the statistics are staggering and I don't have them all in front of me at this moment. And they've definitely shifted since I've written the book um, to, to a much grimmer scenario. But the thing that is always uh, and continues to be startling to me and why I always say in my head, what the fork or what the fuck, is that we have the ability to choose. We have enough access across so many, many, many markets now and socioeconomics now in ways that we didn't have 10 years ago even that we have an opportunity to choose in new ways, yet we still choose the toxic options because we believe that government and industry give a shit. And they don't. Yeah, you talk about in the book that, you know, government regulations against dangerous food additives have been historically ineffective. And I think you say that, you know, not very, food safety in the United States is bad track bad track record when it comes to keeping dangerous food off our collective plates. You also talk about additives such as like MSG back in the day, you know, monosodium glutamate was con classified and, and generally recognized as safe. Yeah. And, and even though the companies didn't have to provide any evidence to support the claim, talk to us a little bit about additives and, and what we don't know and tell us some of the, 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 the small things that we can look at next time we're going down the aisles. I think if I'm going to give a, a few aisle tips that I would love people to most immediately pay attention to that can have, you know, immediate effects. And oftentimes, you know, if you don't have a certain knowledge base, you may not relate the two. But sulfur dioxide, for example, which is used oftentimes on dried fruits. So dried apricots, when you see dried apricots that are you know, bright orange. They're not normally bright orange when they're dried. They're actually a brown color. So sulfur dioxide is actually used um, to maintain the color. Um, oftentimes seafood will be sprayed with sulfur dioxide too. And what that can do is that can tighten a chest very quickly. And so that's a sensitivity um, that can happen. MSG, you know, it's a flavor enhancer. And it's oftentimes used in um, primarily prepared Asian cuisine or in bouillon or in soups um, to enhance sort of the salty flavor um, and, and sort of uh, maintain flavor. 
And again, there's something called MSG symptom complex that can be everything from um, feeling like you have fevers to, uh, you know, your chest tightening to some form of allergic reaction. And um, it's interesting because what, what sort of made me include those particular facets of these ingredients in the book is that I have always reacted to them. And so it just really fascinated me. Sulfites, added sulfites in wines can create problems for a lot of people. And you just, you don't know that you can actually find low sulfite or sulfite free wine. And a lot of these ingredients are, yeah, a lot of these ingredients are added. I mean, you've got, you know, red dye number 40 that I mentioned earlier. So those are some of the keys and also uh, painful are um, artificial sweeteners, any of the artificial sweeteners. Yeah. So let's jump into that, which was uh, part three of the book. The, thank you for expanding on that. And some of the little tips I got from it was... Yeah, the, the sulfates in wine, I just started to drink. I don't drink alcohol anymore, but I do enjoy yeah. drinks. So I'm starting to experiment with alcohol. It's called alcohol-removed wine. Yes. And then at the the grocery stores now, they sell the 0.0, .0 alcohol-free Heineken beers. So yeah. it's interesting and I'm experimenting. Yes, I'm cheating. It's like giving up cigarettes to jump on the vapes. I don't smoke and I don't drink. Anyway, number three that I got from it, part three, say additives used to both preserve and sweeten processed foods can also be potentially harmful. Yeah. And obviously we've been preserving food for thousands of years by using natural methods of you know, freezing, yep. salting, and smoking. Talk to us about how the methods have changed and how companies now use chemicals to preserve foods. Yeah, I mean, there are a whole host of chemicals that preserve foods from, you know, benzoates to sorbates and um, metabisulfates and so on and so forth. And I don't want to turn this into a chemistry class because it can be quite exhausting. Um, but like you said, we have been preserving foods for a really long time um, with simple lemons, salt, um, cold temperatures, even a little bit of sugar, uh, vinegar, um, how we wrap things. And we moved away from that. I don't know. I, I really don't know the, the, the full logic behind it, but we moved away from it because we wanted to expand shelf life primarily, right? That's really what it was about was expanding shelf life. And so we went to all these chemical preservation methods and they're used now in foods that really don't need them. And um, it's just that companies have been uh, become accustomed to using them. And in terms of um, the artificial sweeteners, which are really, you know, those are what are truly problematic for me also, because there is a lot of science that connects them to, to cancer. So everything from sweet and low to acesulfame K to um, aspartame, they come under very, you know, varied brand names. There's, um, you know, you've got uh, manufactured stevia, which is Reb A, which you see as Truvia or Purvia. And I'm just throwing all these names out and it's going to confuse your listeners. But what I will tell your listeners is that um, it's organized and well spelled out in the book. It's an encyclopedic guide. So if you have any specific questions about it, um, refer back there because all of it's there with its science. And, um, the interesting thing that I want to add is five years after the book was published in print, I got an audio deal and that was at the beginning of 2020. So the summer of 2020, the audio book came out. I was asked if I needed to update anything. They asked me to write a new intro, which I did, and they asked if, if I needed to update anything. And the only thing I needed to update was just a couple of facts in the GMO chapter. And that was it. And that's heartbreaking that we have not made, you know, forward moving progress. We haven't made a dent. We've just confused people more. Well, my biggest take on that is, 
Let's look at one company who is not in the food industry. They're actually in the the real estate industry, and everyone's had their food, and we know who we're talking about. And let's 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 call them out, McDonald's. So I want you to talk about how they keep French fries fresh, and I also want you to talk about how I can get my kid off chicken nuggets. So talk to me about what oh. is in in that shit and uh, why. Is my three-year-old son addicted to McDonald's? And every time we drive past, because they're everywhere, says, "Give me a Happy Meal." Like, what's 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 with this bullshit company marketing to children about fucking shit? Yeah. So I mean, it's a it's a multi-billion-dollar endeavor, right? Marketing um, shit food to kids, and um, you know, you know, it's interesting. I was, when my book came out, I was, and I'm going to answer your question in a moment. It just made me think of something that's heartbreaking. But to your point, when my book came out, I went to speak to my older son's class in school. At that time, he was in fifth grade. And I read an excerpt from the book called Cartoon Characters and Crappy Food, which actually addresses this exact question. Okay. And at the end, um, one kid raised, raised his hand and he goes, wait, so colored Gatorade is bad for me? I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, then why does my mommy buy it for me? Okay. And then another kid raised their hand and said, but wait, I don't understand. So they make really unhealthy food cheap. So the people who don't have a ton of money have to buy that kind of food. And I'm like, yeah. And then another kid raised his hand and he said, they don't care about us. They're just greedy. These are fifth graders. Okay. So in response to your question, the first thing I will say is don't take your kids to McDonald's, okay? That's your first mistake is don't even entertain it as part of a conversation because of course they're going to love the colors of, and it's funny, my book is The Color of McDonald's, which is really freaking funny. Um, but of course they're going to love all the colors and, and the happy meal and the packaging and the little gifts that they get. And everything is positioned to make sure that your kid says, mom, dad, I want more. Right. Um, regulations for what they do in, in restaurant chains or even in food companies from the United States to Australia to the EU are, are actually very different, right? So when I wrote this book, for example, um, McDonald's um, strawberry milkshake in the United States didn't have strawberries in it. It just was colored with red dye. But in Europe, you weren't allowed to use the dyes. And so it was they used strawberries, actually. So, um, so the regulations are different. One thing that has happened on a positive note with McDonald's French fries is they are frying them in this country with non-hydrogenated oil, no longer beef tallow, right? Um, and you can ask for them without salt, which just makes them basic French fries. Now, do they put flavoring in there? Probably. They probably put some kind of flavoring in there, but I'm not 100% sure at this point what they're doing or not doing just because my kids don't eat it. And, um, and I haven't looked into it. If I knew that that was your question, I would have researched this exact question. But in terms of the chicken nuggets, okay. Um, and this is a great question because I have this whole thing in my book called the better for you alternatives. So when I break down all the gnarly stuff, I give you better options because there are options. This day and age, there is a healthier version of all that shit out there. And so, for example, there are companies, and I don't know if you have this over where you are, but you can get, um, 
even a, a company like Bell and Evans or a company like um, Applegate Farms or a company like Ian's, they all just do chicken breast breaded tenders. You can get them in the freezer and they're quick to cook. And so what you have to do is when you go to a market, if you don't want to make them yourself, I have a recipe in my book for cornmeal crusted chicken cutlets to give readers the opportunity to make their own chicken nuggets. But um, look in your freezer section. So for example, you know, I have two boys. They're now 16 and 13, but I have some freezer go-tos. And so I keep chicken breast tenders that are already breaded that are, you know, made with very few ingredients in my freezer. So they're a go-to, for example. And so you can find them, but again, turn the box around or turn the bag around and look at the ingredient list. Thank you. Thank you for expanding that. And I must say, look, for those playing at home, my wife, an actual cook as well, and comes from a line of cooks, like you said, your, your um, was it your nan that was? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we her her family come from a long line of cooks her mum actually contributed to a cookbook as well and she comes from the country so they're country cooks and what that means is they use the ingredients that are fresh local and yep. there's no big supermarkets around so that's where my wife learned her cooking early early on now she runs not runs but she's got uh, probably about 100 videos on youtube she's erin's cooking chronicles which she cooks some funny food but she's not a food expert by yourself but what i'm getting back to is we videos on there with our kids and and showing them how to cook as well mm -hmm. teaching your kids early early on that the kitchen is for cooking and where the food comes from and food markets is super important and you know i've got some lofty ambitions in the future to own you know massive fruit you know, like farms like community farms yeah. so i think Talk to me a little bit, and we'll segue through it because uh, we'll run out of time, about what is the future of food and what should we be doing as a, as a family, as a community, as yeah. a state, as a city, as a country, as a society? What, sh what are we moving towards or what should we be moving towards yeah. in the future? Yeah, so I think you bring up a, a, a great point, you know, and by and large, I think that most parents, two young children, um, we'll first say, you know, um, stay out of the kitchen, uh, don't touch sharp objects, stay away from the stove. And so you're creating this sort of fear with a kitchen. I did just the opposite. You know, the kitchen is my sanctuary. The last thing I wanted to do was invite my kids in there because I knew it was going to turn into chaos. But I also wanted to give them a safe space to develop healthy eating habits. And don't get me wrong. I, I may be this like nourishment warrior, but I've got my younger son. The universe's joke on me was born with feeding problems. Like literally it was grueling and he's a picky eater. So that is a whole other area um, where my eyes were opened up. And as I always say, everything I learned in grad school, I throw out the door. Because when you've got a kid like that, that's a whole new lesson. You've got to be open. So I opened my kitchen. My kids were using knives at two. They would come to the grocery store, supervised, mind you, because I've had people comment on videos like, what are you letting your kids use knives for? If they're supervised, they can use them. You don't leave them in the kitchen with a knife. I mean, come on, you know, use your brain, right? But I take them to the supermarket with me. I let them put groceries away. All wrong. So I go back and I fix it, but at least it gets them connected. I take them to a farmer's market. I take them to a farm. I take them to a garden to volunteer, a community garden to volunteer. I let them cook with me. They make a mess. They did make a mess. So what? I had to let go. I am type A, I am ADD, I am OCD, I just let go. And you know what? It's paid off in rainbows later on. And so what we have to do as parents is address our own food issues so we don't pass them down to our kids. 
and we have to be open. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it all comes down to self-awareness and knowing that, hey, hang on a sec, just because we're brought up this way and how we're in a certain, everyone's got a different relationship with food. I'm a binge yeah. eater. I like to eat luxury. I like to eat, you know, fine cuisine. And I like to eat, you know, privately by myself. I'm a, you know, I have real mixed issues with food, but you know, yeah. food is one of those things that's such a staple in our daily life. It's how do we get our three meals a day? And you're always thinking about what's for breakfast, what's for lunch, what's for dinner, and what am I going to eat tomorrow? What's for dessert? It's such a full time gig, is what I'm getting at. So I think it's probably a good time to wrap the podcast because you've done it's you've you've got so much information in the book, and I I really want people to go out there and buy the book and read the book too because you talk about keeping a food journal to get a better sense of bad habits, and there's so many notes that we haven't talked about as well. But can you talk about the best place where people can sort of find your book, find yourself, and where yeah. do you spend most of the time online? Is it Amazon or the website where they can buy the book from? Well, you can you can go to my website at stephaniesacks.com. That's uh, Stephanie with an F for food, and it's S-A-C-K-S.com. And you can find a link to the book there, and it will take you to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Indie Books, um, and you can get it there, and you can also – you know, tap into the audio if that's what you prefer. Um, so that's where you can find me. I stay most active on social media via Instagram. Um, you can also connect with me because I teach a, a monthly cooking class called Come Cook from my kitchen to yours. It's $25, um, not very expensive. And if you're a newcomer, uh, you know, I offer a discount code, one per email, which is discount. It's hundred percent off. It's come cook 22 and your audience is welcome to use that to come try it. Um, what time is it there? It's a 6 so got it here. PM so it's a month, class. It's a monthly live, yeah, monthly live Zoom cooking class, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Uh, ETD. I invite you to connect with Nourishment. Yeah, great. I'll, I'll try to be there. It might be early times for, for us in Australia, but uh, how long have you yeah. been doing that for? I started doing that, uh, you know, like in the height of the pandemic. So de December of 2020, 2020 was when I really dove into that more regularly and I was doing it once a week and now I've moved it to once a month because I just have too many other things that I'm working on. So definitely. And just the last thing, you've got a new website coming along. Is that correct? Yeah. Very exciting. Probably in the next three months, it's going to be fully launched or we'll, we'll be in a soft la launch and it's what the fork are you eating.com. So it's WT fork. And then the letters are you and then eating.com. And it will be um, populated with a lot of videos. So it's going to be more video-driven information from my book, um, kitchen and culinary basics, pantry rehab. So how can you kind of uh, up the game on your pantry? What am I doing in my pantry? Um, we're going to have some live classes as well as some recorded classes, lots of recipes, and a lots and lots and lots of stuff for kids because kids are our future. And um, that's where I really want to spend so much of my focus is is in giving the younger generations tools. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you for all your work and over 30 years, uh, I believe, of helping us all and educating as well. So keep at it. You've got a, probably another 30 years to go. So um, <laughs> you're only halfway through. <laughs> I don't know about that. We'll all see. Right, Steph. But thank you uh, so we'll much. We'll see. Anyway, you, you've done a lot anyway. Appreciate you coming on the Best Book Bits podcast. And to my audience out there, go a go follow Stephanie at her website, Instagram, buy her book. It is fantastic. So again, Stephanie, thanks for being a guest on the Best Book Bits podcast and uh, we'll catch up in the future. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for having me.